Hello and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Ladi Akhiri Dulwale, the headlines. U.S. House of Representatives approves $40 billion to assist Ukraine fight against the Russian invasion. Ukrainian troops recapture towns near Kharkiv as Russia accuses it of using civilians as shields. And Putin's representatives in the occupied Crimea region says occupied Ukrainian regions will be part of Russia. It's 11 weeks exactly today since Russia invaded Ukraine. Since then, the United States has been sending military and humanitarian aid to that country. The latest development is that the U.S. House of Representatives has approved more than $40 billion in more aid for Ukraine as Congress races to keep military aid flowing and boost the government in Kiev. The House passed the Ukraine spending bill by 368 votes to 57 with every no vote coming from the Republicans. The measure now heads to the Senate, which is also expected to act quickly. President Joe Biden had asked Congress to approve an additional $33 billion in aid for Ukraine two weeks ago, but the lawmakers decided to increase the military and humanitarian funding. Mr. Biden had also called on Congress to move quickly so he could sign the bill into law before existing defense aid for Ukraine runs out later in May. Some Republicans had opposed the bill, criticizing Democrats for moving too quickly to send too many U.S. taxpayer dollars abroad. Boys and girls. On this vote, the yeas are 368, the nays are 57. The bill is passed. Without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid on the table. What I think it's important for the American people to know is that what Putin has done is not only an act of brutality, it's an act of cowardice. Who but a coward would pretend he's going to war and bomb a, mater a maternity hospital? Who but a coward would, uh, would have his soldiers resort to the cruelty of rape of children or um, uh, their parents in front of them, boys and girls? Who but a coward would pile these children in trains and take them to Russia? All of this will be a matter of, a, of, of coming to justice at some point. But right now, we have to have it come to a conclusion that you don't do that. It's outside the circle of civilized human behavior. Putin, coward. So in any event, what we're doing here is very important, is supplying weaponry and security assistance, government and economic assistance, humanitarian assistance, and I thank Congresswoman Lee and Mr. McGovern for their uh, f focus on all of that. Uh, so we're very proud of what this gives us today. We should all be very proud, all be proud of it, that we had the opportunity when Putin decided, whatever it is he decided, to be brutal and cruel and a coward, that we were there to help. It's about democracy versus a dictatorship. Democracy must prevail. The Ukrainian people are fighting the fight for their democracy and in doing so for ours as well. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of the additional Ukraine Supplemental Appropriations Act, which provides $40.1 billion in much needed emergency security, economic and humanitarian aid to support the Ukrainian people and defend global democracy in the wake of Russia's unprovoked attack on Ukraine. For nearly three months now, Putin's greed, growing aggression, and unyielding pursuit of power have led to grievous loss of life and humanitarian devastation. The cruelty against innocent civilians at the hands of Putin and his cronies is devastating. The images of the violence and terror coming from Ukraine should horrify us all. Entire cities are being demolished. 
Ukraine's democracy is being undermined every single day. Women and girls are being sexually abused by cruel Russian soldiers. Hospitals and universities, which should be safe havens, are being intentionally attacked. War crimes are being carried out every single day as part of a deeply dangerous pattern of extensive shootings, torture, and other violent crimes. And none of the devastation caused would have been possible without help from Putin's cronies. And for that reason, the funding in this bill will continue efforts to hold them accountable for the terror they have caused the people of Ukraine with funds to seize, retain, and sell the forfeited property of Russia's criminal kleptocrats who enable the Putin's regime war crimes. This bill ensures that we are one step closer to making them pay the full price for their actions. And in the process, we will be standing firmly with the Ukrainian people while combating the exploitation of Ukraine's vulnerable financial system. And for those Ukrainians who managed to find refuge at our borders, this bill provides funds to expand support services that will make sure they feel safe here as they search for peace and for freedom. Meanwhile, the United States believes that Russian President Vladimir Putin is preparing for a long conflict in Ukraine and a Russian victory in the Donbass east of the country might not end the war, and that's a statement from the U.S. Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines. We assess President Putin is preparing for a prolonged conflict in Ukraine, during which he still intends to achieve goals beyond the Donbass, uh, Ms. Haines told lawmakers. She added that Putin was counting on the Western resolve to weaken over time, and as the conflict continued, there was concern about how this uh, would develop in the coming months. That Russia has a greater ability and will... The committee meets today to receive testimony on the worldwide threats facing the United States and our international partners. I'd like to welcome Director of National Intelligence Avril Haines and Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency Lieutenant General Scott D. Barrier. Thank you both for joining us and please convey the committee's gratitude to the men and women of the intelligence community for their critical work. The next month or two of fighting will be significant as the Russians attempt to reinvigorate their efforts, but even if they are successful, we are not confident that the fight in the Donbass will effectively end the war. We assess President Putin is preparing for a prolonged conflict in Ukraine during which he still intends to achieve goals beyond the Donbass. But Putin most likely also judges that Russia has a greater ability and willingness to endure challenges than his adversaries, and he is probably counting on U.S. and E.U. resolve to weaken as food shortages, inflation, energy prices get worse. Moreover, as both Russia and Ukraine believe they can continue to make progress militarily, we do not see a viable negotiating path forward, at least in the short term. The uncertain nature of the battle, which is developing into a war of attrition, combined with the reality that Putin faces a mismatch between his ambitions and Russia's current conventional military capabilities, likely means the next few months could see us moving along a more unpredictable and potentially escalatory trajectory. I think uh, I would characterize it as um, uh, the Russians aren't winning and the Ukrainians aren't winning, and we're, we're at a bit of a stalemate here. And two U.S. senators have introduced a resolution that would call on the Biden administration to list Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism. Republican Lindsey Graham and uh, Democrat Richard Blumenthal cited actions during Russia's invasion of Ukraine and incidents where Russia supported fighters in Syria and Chechnya prior to the invasion. Members of the Ukrainian parliament voted last week to urge the United States to recognize Russia as a terror sponsor citing atrocities committed in Butcher, Mariupol, and other Ukrainian cities. President Zelensky of Ukraine had asked Mr. Biden to name Russia a state sponsor last month. And as bombs explode across the country in Ukraine, uh, the United States a Strategic Partnership provides military support and financial aid to that country. Our Washington correspondent has more on this. The United States continues to provide aid to Ukraine despite the war's impact on the global economy. I'm signing a bill that provides another important tool in our efforts to support 
the government of Ukraine and the Ukrainian people in their fight to defend their country uh, and their democracy against Putin's brutal war. And it is brutal. I want to thank members of Congress here for getting this passed and everyone who supported the bill. And the bill demonstrates the support for Ukraine is pivotal at this moment. Every day, Ukrainians pay with their lives, and they fight along against the, the atrocities that the Russians are engaging in are just beyond the pale. And uh, the cost of the fight is not cheap, but uh, caving to aggression is even more costly. The bill signed by President Biden will streamline the process for the U.S. to lend and lease military equipment to Ukraine. This is in addition to the $150 million package of funding that the U.S. announced it will provide Ukraine to combat Russia. Despite the economic impacts of the war, Americans continue to strongly support the president and the U.S. active engagement in providing Ukraine with aid to fight Russia. While the White House is hopeful that the war will end soon, it is evident that Republicans and Democrats are in favor of supporting Ukraine until the end. From Washington, Maria Byrd, Channel Television News. Let's talk now to our correspondent in Washington, Maria Byrd, who joins us uh, virtually from there. Uh, good morning, Maria. Early morning for you today. Good morning, yes. Let me start uh, from uh, the politics of all of this. The, the support for all the spending uh, is not universal uh, in the United States. Uh, there, are Demo uh, there are Republicans in the House of Representatives, for example, and there are expectations that there will be some in the Senate who will, uh, shall we say, oppose all this spending uh, at a time that the U.S. economy itself is having some difficulties. Yes, you're exactly correct. There has been um, quite a bit of support, and I think that there's no question whether or not you sit on the Republican side or the Democratic side of the House that the war and that the U.S. should be supporting Ukraine. The question is the financial aid. As we know, there has already been millions of dollars set aside. Uh, we are now, you know, heading toward um, close to over billions of dollars uh, of support aid to Ukraine, and so that is going to become a major concern, as you mentioned, with the financial crises. Uh, that the U.S. is unfortunately experiencing in some ways, and as many Americans are anticipating, will continue to get worse. And so uh, that is going to be the number one focal point for especially Republicans, as you said, that they will they vote and will they go in favor of this bill to be able to move forward to provide additional support. Now, we also know the White House has been very strategic in placing individuals, high-ranking government officials, and even the First Lady coming over to Ukraine to state uh, that the U.S. will continue to be in support, even if we see some trouble in future aid packages to Ukraine. At the level of the Senate, I mean, uh, the vote in the House of Representatives uh, was fairly overwhelming, but uh, in the Senate, it appears as if it's likely to be a lot closer. It's almost 50-50 uh, for both parties. So while, as you say, the United States overwhelmingly is in a general support. Uh, the battle may be slightly tougher to get this through uh, the Senate. The Senate, um, we know that the Senate is, is going to be split. The Senate has definitely given uh, President Biden and his administration a much greater challenge um, over the past few years. And we also know that as as we're heading toward the midterm elections, uh, that that is another major factor which is going to put um, a little bit more pressure. Now, do I do many Republicans believe it will not pass in the Senate? I don't think they believe it will not pass, but I think that they're going to send a clear signal uh, that they are not in full agreement of the way in which President Biden has moved forward, and more specifically, they're not in agreement with the way the financial uh, impact this is having on the U.S. economy. Let's talk about the U.S. economy itself. Uh, the last time I had you here, uh, we, we were talking about uh, fairly galloping prices uh, of, of energy, uh, particularly fuel and other, uh, other such uh, products, uh, which were a direct consequence of what is going on in Ukraine. And we, of course, also discussed how that could possibly impact uh, the midterms. Uh, between then and now, today, it's uh, 11 weeks since all of this started. Uh, have there been any changes? What, what, what's uh, the pulse on the ground there? 
The pulse on the ground at this point is really that we're continuing to see the highest rates of gas that have been seen in years now. We're heading toward, obviously, um, a focus on energy efficiency, infrastructure bills. But if you really listen to a lot of what uh, the plans are in place, it's not going to be an overnight process. And the question is, are Americans going to be patient enough to be able to wait it out? Um, as uh, we know, as you mentioned, supply chain challenges that exist, which means a rise in other prices, grocery stores, and the like. And so that is the question that are Americans going to be patient enough and are there going to be uh, programs put in place? Now, what we're going to be watching for, is President Biden going to give any more stimulus? Can the U.S. afford to give additional stimulus to Americans who are suffering at the rate of the pump? We know that some states were able to offer tax credits, reduction of taxes on gas, uh, but that has expired. Are there going to be additional reserves brought forth uh, to be able to reduce some of those gas prices? We know that the president has been working uh, with various um, companies, Chevron, Shell, and the likes, uh, to try to ensure and look at ways to be able to bring additional gas resources to the U.S. Let's talk about the midterms themselves. Uh, it promises, I mean, we, we, we hear all the time that the the party that has control of the White House uh, usually gets punished in the midterms, uh, and that has been the case for quite a while now. Uh, but there was, and there seems to still be, broad support uh, for uh, Mr. Biden, especially uh, in his position in this uh, Ukrainian uh, war situation. But what you've just talked about, the economic cost of that, uh, is creating some political problems ahead of this midterms. Uh, so what, what what's he trying to do to ensure that the Democrats, even if they lose some ground, do not lose too much? Well, you know, the Democrats are in a very uh, sticky situation um, at this time, to be very honest. And the White House is working on ways to be able to adjust that and to, and to try to change that. Now, the president is going to have to be a little bit bold um, over the next couple of months. And I think we're going to expect to see some bold moves coming out of the White House and other Democrats. And we're going to begin to see kind of the influence of some of those longstanding Democrats who have had major impacts on the U.S. political landscape and they're going to have to be a little bit outside of the box and so the question is are they willing to come outside of the traditional democratic landscape of politics especially as we enter the midterms because republicans are definitely doing that uh, we can see a, a great rise in the number of individuals who have supported president trump in the past or president trump in the past and as they're calling them the magna republicans those who are who follow the the likes and the and the ideologies of former president trump which are a little different different than the original and the traditional Republican Party. And so is that going to be able to have enough momentum that it will bring those individuals out to the polls, come, um, come the midterms, and will those individuals be able to also influence others who are on the line? Are people going to potentially cross party lines and go from Democrats to Republican um, when the midterm elections um, arrive? And as we know, we've already had some elections here in the U.S. Indeed, they do. Thank you so much uh, uh, for the perspective, Berea. Uh, thank you for reporting. I uh, will see you again sometime soon. Thank you so much. Russian President Vladimir Putin's representatives to the occupied region of Crimea, Georgi Morodov, has said that areas of southern Ukraine liberated by Moscow's troops will become regions of Russia. In a statement, he claimed this, as we assess from our communication with the inhabitants of the region, is the will of the people themselves, most of whom lived for eight years under conditions of repression and bullying uh, by the Ukro-Nazis, as he described them. He added, military civilian administrations are being formed in these territories. Russian TV channels have come here. Russian test books have appeared in schools. The Russian ruble is successfully entering the economic life of the region. The head of Russia's National Defense Control Center says that Ukrainian soldiers have staged a, quote, provocation in Kharkiv by shooting six civilian vehicles, according to state news agencies. Uh, according to Colonel General Mikhail Mitsev, in the Kharkiv region, the Kiev regime carried out another bloody action in accordance with a butcher scenario. On the section of the road between the settlements of Stari and Novi Saltov, servicemen of the armed forces of Ukraine shot six civilian vehicles with white flags mounted on them. Uh, General Metsensev also said the Ukrainian army used the residents of homes as human shields by positioning themselves in private houses 
in Balea, Krinetsa, in the Kherson region, and attacking several troops uh, so they would never return fire. The governor of Kharkiv had earlier reported that Russia had intensified shelling uh, in the area. But footage released from the Ukrainian armed forces purportedly showing a Russian tank being destroyed in the Kharkiv Oblast as Ukraine pushes a counteroffensive in the north of the country. The video shared on social media channels shows a solitary tank on a road near buildings exploding after being struck uh, by rocket fire. Ukraine's Ministry of Defense said the attack was carried out on a T-90M, Russia's most advanced. And after the break, Ukraine says it will halt key Russian gas pipeline to Europe. Join us again. Thanks for staying tuned. Ukraine says its forces have recaptured villages from Russian troops north and northeast of Kharkiv, pressing a counteroffensive that could signal a shift in the war's momentum and jeopardize Russia's main advance. Kharkiv, a Russia's second, or rather Ukraine's second largest city, had been under perpetual bombardment since the war began. The counterattack could signal a new phase in the war, with Ukraine now going on the offensive after weeks in which Russia mounted a massive assault without making a breakthrough. By pushing back Russian forces who had occupied the outskirts of Kharkiv since the start of the invasion, the Ukrainians are moving into striking distance of the rare supply lines, sustaining the main Russian attack force further south. And Russian forces opened fire 15 times on the residential areas and infrastructure in Luhansk uh, yesterday. That's according to the region's governor. Sergei Hedai said a school for children with special needs was hit by shelling. He wrote on Telegram, fortunately, we evacuated the pupils of the school in advance. Hedai added that the main gas pipeline in Sarovdonetsk was also damaged, and there's no light in the city for a second day. Let's talk to Nigerian Army General, military strategist, former Provost Marshal of uh, the Nigerian Army talking about Major General Pat Akem. He joins us uh, from our Abuja studios. Uh, good morning, General. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Lady. Thanks for having me here. The situation is uh, becoming uh, more and more uh, complicated, shall we say. Uh, you, you probably heard the, the U.S. Uh, Director of uh, National Intelligence and uh, uh, the Director of Military Intelligence saying there that uh, the Russians can't win, the Ukrainians can't win. It's like a, a kind of a military stalemate. Uh, what do you do militarily as a strategist when you're in that kind of situation? Okay, thanks. Um, what we're having right now appears to be a battle of attrition, and it will go on for a while. Um, this war is going to be won and lost on the back of logistics. And I recall that General Omar Bradley, one of the few generals to reach five stars in the U.S. Army, once said, and, and I quote, amateurs discuss strategy, professionals talk uh, logistics. Um, with the logistics continuing to be flowing to Ukraine, it looks uh, on present evidence to be so. Uh, the signing of the Land Lease Act by Biden, we facilitate continuous flow of logistics quickly like it was done during the uh, Second World War before America joined the war. Uh, so logistics will keep flowing in. Will Russia continue to sustain its firing of even hypersonic missiles that are very expensive? Will they continue to fire and destroy uh, cities, infrastructure, and perhaps break the economy of um, Ukraine? Where based on the number of uh, sanctions that have been imposed and is, uh, the effect they are going to have going forward, uh, if it continues like this, there will be a statement. So this, this war uh, that has been punctuated by log logistic hiccups, um, poor planning, 
on the part of Russia uh, who are, appears to have entered into the first the level of attrition where no one is winning, so to speak. Because even in Kharkiv, where you mentioned, uh, uh, Ukraine has taken, taken back some of the, the areas that were captured. But Russia is a, a, it's a big military power. Uh, and with a population of uh, 145 million people, uh, it's able to draw, at least from the human perspective, draw a lot of uh, troops anytime it wants. Uh, whether they will continue to produce the logistics required, some of well, the components will be required to come from outside. So I don't know uh, about on current evidence, battle of attrition, and of course the way to fight. And the Ukrainians have the way to fight. Um, they feel that the, this war was unprovoked. They feel that the, it shouldn't have happened. And uh, I mean, the other day I had a, a woman, an old woman of 80 years old, saying, if I, if I get Putin, I will tear him apart. So when the anger gets to that boiling point, it means that we just keep fighting until the last man. Given that scenario, though, uh, because you seem to agree that it's a war of attrition and nobody really is winning. Uh, so it will probably take the point you mentioned, which is the issue of logistics and who can probably draw on the better logistics. The Ukrainians have the support of the West. The Russians have the armaments and the people. Uh, so it's who is going to be able to put this uh, uh, together faster and more efficiently. But in terms of what is going on, even in surrounding areas, I mean, because this is not only about Russia and Ukraine, all the other countries in the surrounding area are also revising their strategies. Uh, you talk, you're talking about Finland uh, and Denmark, for example, reconsidering, Sweden. What, yeah, uh, Sweden rather, uh, trying to reconsider whether or not they should join NATO. In fact, I believe that sometime this week, either today or at the end of this week, one of them is actually going to make that decision about whether or not to join yeah. or to seek to join. Yeah. So in terms of that broader picture, is that also going to, do you think, play a role in what and how this situation, this military stalemate within Ukraine ultimately ends. Do you think so? Yeah, see, some of the strategic imperatives that uh, provoke this war have been found to be miscalculations. And, and, and they are forced to reason because, you see, uh, one time Mike Tyson made a statement that appears to be very true today. He said everybody has a plan until they are hitting them out. So there was a plan. The plan was capture Ukraine, destroy its, its army, install a new government, remove uh, Zelensky, install a new government that will be pliant to the wishes of Russia. And then the, the overarching uh, goal was to, to, to just divide NATO and make them virtually ineffective. The contrary has happened. Nations have become afraid, looking at the, the brutal nature of the war going on now, the destruction of, destructions of villages, towns, cities, uh, the, 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 the sheer volume of force that has been leased or, or unleashed on a nation that is smaller in stature uh, has made other nations to sit back and take a second look at what their security imperatives are. Uh, so Finland is moving closer and closer, and like you said this week, they, they are likely to to submit the application to join NATO. Um, NATO has become even stronger. If you look at the number of visits by high-profile leaders uh, to Ukraine, even in the face of the danger uh, that they face, um, shows that NATO is uh, binding and becoming stronger and stronger. Uh, of course, America has entered into this uh, and is likely to, to stay the course. So. Um, the, the desired outcomes have appear not to have been met, so to speak, um, and uh, it will continue. I, I, I mean, because even France now is is carrying out exercises and retraining and recalibrating to see uh, because the posture has changed. So basically, uh, you are right. Uh, nations are sitting on edge, and they will continue to bind together as a collective to serve as a counterweight to what uh, Putin may do in the future. But I, I will consider that Putin is a smart person. Uh, you can't rule a nation for 22 years without a nation of 145 million people for 22 years without some certain level of strategic thinking. So I think that Putin too will re recalibrate and I may, I may come up with some things. If he sees, even though the general agreement is, uh, the general summation is that 
it will be a prolonged war. Why Putin sees something that he can take away as a, as a token of victory, then they may negotiate. And especially if he holds the, the Donbass region, um, he, that may become a very good leverage to, to negotiate upon. You were provost marshal of uh, the Nigerian army and therefore in a very good position uh, to talk about what, what I want to mention next, which is the issue of discipline uh, within uh, the armed forces. I mean, everybody takes it for, uh, for granted that uh, within, the, uh, within the armed forces, discipline is the watchword. Uh, but there are, times of, uh, uh, there are times in war when discipline is the difference between success and failure. Uh, and then, of course, the manner Very of putting so. together, yes, the manner of putting together uh, the forces uh, that you are fighting with uh, also tends to have impact on, on the discipline. When you put the Ukrainian forces and the Russian forces uh, on a scale, uh, so far, 11 weeks down the line, who do you see uh, uh, on balance as having put together what is necessary in terms of discipline? On current evidence and from what we are seeing, the Ukrainians appear to be more disciplined. Um, it looks like the Russian forces, even though Russia is a, is a big military power, um, but you know, the kind of battles you fight will also determine the kind of discipline you have. If you are having the kind of enemy where you bomb and reduce them to, to nothing and then you, you do not need to really occupy the ground and, and do things, then Again, if you, do, if, if, if you were not involved in that for a, a long while, then the level of discipline you bring to the table will be different. Uh, so on current evidence from what we have seen from intercepts, uh, communicating on open lines, uh, sabotaging um, um, fighting equipment, um, virtually disobeying orders, normally, normally you don't have that in professional, highly professional armed forces. Uh, so it appeared that some young guys who were thrust into battle, who had not seen combat before, are not doing things that they should be are, are doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Uh, of course, the, the, the Ukrainians have an impetus and a motivation to fight. Like I said, they keep feeling that this was an unprovoked war and that this is their land. Um, they have more at stake than the Russians. They have uh, the Russians have a little bit of luxury. Uh, but the Ukrainians have no, no, no able room to, within which to say, oh, we will not, we'll not be disciplined, we'll, we'll misbehave. So, yeah, on current evidence, discipline, on, on current evidence, the, the Ukrainians, and discipline has a lot to do with whether you win or lose a, lose a war. Uh, but again, Russia is a massive force. They can draw from resources continually. Um, so when it becomes a prolonged battle of attrition for a long haul with... The Ukrainians keep getting the support they are getting. If governments change within NATO, will they still get the support they are getting? So uh, basically, uh, the, 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 the jury is yet uh, is out, uh, has not come in. There are people who talk about uh, leverage here and, and, and a balance of forces, which then enables uh, peace to be discussed. Uh, one of my previous guests had said that, look, that for both parties to consider peace viable, uh, there needs to be some kind of military equilibrium. You were a uh, former commander of Operation Safe Haven, and in that role, uh, you were also uh, saddled with uh, the issue of peace. Uh, and so I want to ask, do you think that the situation, as you've, as you've seen it, on the ground in, in Ukraine right now, I mean, if you were a military if, uh, a commander on the ground in Ukraine, do you think on either side now uh, it would be good to consider peace. Look, the Ukrainians are open to peace. The level of destruction, the economy has contracted 30%. Um, Fuel is on is scarce now. Uh, grains are sitting in silos instead of being exported. So Ukraine is suffering a lot. Without the help that is coming from outside, the nation would have collapsed. So the Ukrainians, Zelensky will tell you firsthand that he wants, he wants peace, he wants to negotiate. The only clog in the, in the, in the wheel towards uh, negotiation is the fact that Ukraine feels that this was an unprovoked war, it's a land grab, and that no territory of theirs will be seized by Russia or considered. So that, that is the only reason why there may be no negotiation. But again, I'm thinking that uh, President Putin 
uh, we also look for a way to negotiate. If the imperatives, if the if the picture on the ground appears favorable, uh, and if you can save face, if you can say yes, we've gotten something tangible. Um, so yeah, the options are very open for peace, uh, for negotiation, for peace, and uh, the Ukrainians even more so. Uh, they want the one peace because the economy is being destroyed, um, the country is the country is suffering. One hundred, about 15 million people displaced. Five million migrants in Europe. Uh, they, no, no peace. Beautiful cities reduced to rubble. So Ukrainians have more, more, more motiv motivation, more motives to, to, to negotiate. But Russia will also want to get something tangible to show that, look, uh, we went into war and we're coming away with this. And that is why the Donbass region is very critical. Uh, and they've taken virtually 80% of it, uh, unknown to many, 80% of the land. And then, of course, they are now, they are now putting pressure on, on Ukraine, uh, firing, firing uh, hypersonic missiles into Odessa, the only port that appears to be viable now. Uh, once that is shut down, it's virtually even the aid coming from outside Ukraine will become threatened. So, yeah, there, are, there, is, there is a lot of room for negotiation and, and um, a lot of motivation to negotiate. There's a lot I, I, I would like to say that it would be yes. good if, if America and, and NATO kind of push Putin towards saving face so that he can, he can go away with something uh, to show that, yes, because the suffering is too much. Hmm. A lot there to chew. Uh, uh, Major General Pat Akem, uh, thank you so much uh, for your perspective this morning. Uh, it was nice to speak to you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Larry. It's a, pr a pleasure and a privilege. Thank you so much. Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi in a meeting with U.S. President Joe Biden says Russia's invasion of Ukraine had made ties between the United States and Italy stronger, a sentiment Mr. Biden said he agreed with. Sitting down with the U.S. President in the Oval Office, Mr. Draghi told reporters the two leaders would discuss energy and food security during their White House meeting. think about what can we do to bring peace. We, we certainly have to use any direct, indirect, indirect channel communication, but is that enough? What can we do? Uh, people think that, uh, at least they want to think in, in Italy and in Europe now, people want to put an end to these massacres, to these massacres, to these violence, this butchering that's happening. And people think about what can we do to bring peace. We, we certainly have to use any direct, indirect, indirect channel of communication. But is that enough? What can we do? Uh, people think that uh, at least they want to think about the possibility of bringing a ceasefire and starting against incredible negotiations. That's the situation right now. I think that we have to think deeply on how to address this. We will continue, you and I, to work on energy yes, security, food security especially, which is now another issue there. We will talk later about that, what to do. And, um, and uh, the other thing I want to say, just at the opening, then I don't think we will discuss this later, but uh, what happened in Ukraine is going to bring a, a drastic change in European Union. And Ukraine has said for the first time since the war started that it would suspend the flow of natural gas through a transit point, which it says delivers almost a third of the fuel piped from Russia to Europe through Ukraine. Kiev blames Moscow for the move, saying it would move the flows elsewhere. Even after Russia invaded Ukraine in February, it remained a major transit route for European gas. Uh, however, Russian troops have been taking gas transiting through Ukraine and sending it to Russian-backed separatist areas in the eastern Donbas region of the country, and that's according to the boss of the operator of Ukraine's gas network, Getso. Getso says it would stop shipments via the Sokoroneva route from today. Russia's state-owned energy giant Gazprom said it had received notification from Ukraine that it would stop the transit of gas to Europe via the interconnector 
from 7 a.m. However, Gazprom, which has a monopoly on Russian gas exports by pipeline, says it is technologically impossible to shift all volumes to the Sutsa interconnection point further west, as Gitsu had proposed. We'll be talking to Ladi Williams in just a moment about what all of this means. Uh, but before that, let's uh, take a short break uh, and then we'll be right back. A crew of firefighters was today deployed to the site of missile strikes in the southern Ukrainian city of Odessa, where one person was killed and five others injured. Spokeswoman of Ukraine's Operational Command South, Natalia Humenyuk, told the media that seven missiles were launched in the direction of a shopping center and a depot. Video footage from the scene showed smoke billowing and rescue workers combing through piles of rubble. German Foreign Minister Annalena Babok has toured the Kiev suburb of Buka and said, these victims could be us. The foreign minister said this after making an unannounced visit to Ukraine, where she likened the Kiev suburb to the Berlin suburb of Potsdam, where she lived with her family, saying, You can see playgrounds, supermarkets, you can see people going to work, and then you can see the worst traces of crimes just next to it, a bomb which hit the supermarket right in the middle. According to Ukrainian authorities, more than 400 civilians were killed in Buka. Amnesty International said last week there was compelling evidence that Russian troops had committed war crimes, including extrajudicial executions of civilians where they occupied an area outside Ukraine's capital in February and March, when they occupied an area northwest of Kiev. Meanwhile, French European Affairs Minister Clement Bune has said that European Union members could reach a deal this week on EU Commission's proposal to ban all oil imports from Russia. He also added that French President Emmanuel Macron was due to talk with Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban later in the day. Hungary is the most vocal critic of this planned embargo on Russian oil. The U.S. is also speeding up military aid to Ukraine with the signing of a present-day version of a lending program that helped defeat Hitler's Germany. The original Lend-Lease Act let Washington lend or lease weapons to its allies. The new version will allow the same to Ukraine immediately. Before he signed the bill, President Biden said it was time again to form a global force for peace. The sole condition is repayment at some later date, and the policy will also help other Eastern European countries affected by Russia's invasion. But uh, caving to aggression is even more costly. That's why we're staying in this. Yesterday we, saw we did promise that we'll be talking to Aladi Williams as we welcome you back uh, on the business stories of the day, which we talked about. Uh, Aladi Williams, thank you for your time. Good morning. Good morning. So let us l uh, take a look at this. Yeah. So there's a threat to stop gas flowing through Ukraine to Europe. But Europe is already battling shortages. Exactly. And so who's really going to have a problem with this? <laughs> well, at the end of the day, Europe is going to feel the, the pinch of, of all of this because we know how heavily reliant you know, Europe is on uh, Russian gas. But you know, at this point, uh, I guess to is saying, you know what, we're going to you know, channel this gas through another uh, pipeline. But you know, Russia is saying, you, know, we, you cannot use that pipeline. It's, it's too far away you know, to you know, get to our customers. 
But now we're seeing, I guess, to say that, you know what, uh, there's, they're, you know, evoking a force majeure. This points to, you know, show that they cannot continue carry out their, you know, uh, transitory uh, business of moving, you know, gas from Russia uh, to uh, Europe. And uh, Gazprom is saying, you know, we do not see any uh, force majeure, you know, incident, you know, with your uh, activities. But at the end of the day, we're carrying out our obligations to our customers. So whatever happens, that's on you. So Gazprom is saying, you know what, this is not on us. We are sending our gas to Europe. It now depends on Ukraine to actually Yeah, and if Ukraine uh, stops it, it flowing through. Exactly, then Europe is going to feel the pinch of, of this one. That's that, that, uh, that we'll have to wait and see how that yeah. goes. Now, more, more disturbing uh, is uh, the war said to be wiping $1.5 trillion off the global economy. I mean, there's no surprise that there's value being wiped up. Right. It's the amount that will probably yeah, surprise a, a huge, lot of people. It's a huge amount, and it's global, you know, this time. It's not just, you know, a few countries that are going to feel this uh, pinch. But we're seeing energy uh, prices rise. We're seeing inflation hit new highs, you know, all over the world. And central bankers increasing uh, rates. We've seen the Fed, you know, go up uh, 50 basis points, like twice now, and there's a possibility they might go more aggressive. We've seen uh, also uh, the central bank in England, you know, do the same thing in Europe. So at, this, at the end of the day, rates going up this much would lead to a recession. And a recession means a slowdown in, in business activities that would impact, you know, the monies, you know, being made uh, globally. So this uh, research is saying, you know what, with all that's going on, with what's happening in China, war in Ukraine, energy prices going up, inflation still spiking, even though there are talks about inflation peaking at some point, but we're not seeing that yet. So they're saying, no, the outlook is a loss, a global loss at this point, even with, um, you know, food security issues, because obviously we see Ukraine and Russia are major, you know, grain uh, exporters, you know, globally, and we, we see how uh, uh, Afri North uh, Africa is already feeling that impact. Egypt is reeling, you know, yeah, right from now. The they're they're of wheat. not able to, you know, uh, get as much wheat as they need to, you know, feed their country. So it's, uh, it's, it's no surprise. All other uh, indications are showing that this war is, uh, is going to be a global, it has global implication. Everybody is going to feel the pinch. I'm already feeling the pinch at this point. We see markets already <laughs> in uh, record red at right. this point. We've seen Bitcoin is still going down as opposed to, we see investors moving away from risk assets all because of what's going on. But at the end of the day, the Fed have, and uh, central bankers have a lot of work to do. To do indeed. How do you balance this exactly without, 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 stoking, without stoking a recession? The, the, the issues, of course, uh, uh, are also affecting oil prices. Uh, this war, uh, the EU is trying to ensure that uh, before the end of the year or by the year's end, it puts a ban on, on, on Russian uh, exactly. oil and gas. They're trying so hard not to fund this war. Now <laughs> that is, uh, even if that were to be achieved by the year's end, between now and then, it means that the prices for oil and gas are going to be at a premium. And we've already seen that. We've seen that happen. New highs for oil and gas prices. Because we, we might see the last high actually broken, you know, with the way it's going. So... Now, you know, the, the, the Europe is modeling more uh, ways to, you know, re re reduce the reliance on, on uh, Russian oil. And as that goes on, the other, you know, uh, producers cannot meet up, you know, when it comes to uh, meeting up the production and, you know, showing the gap that we'll see uh, when uh, Russian oil actually stops uh, hitting the market. When, but at the end of the day, we still have you know, buyers. We, we still have friendly countries that would buy from Russia, you know, but at the end of the day, all prices are really volatile right now, but any disruption to supply will stoke prices. That's why we see, obviously, we know Biden is, has done all he can to make sure these prices actually come down. Because at the end of the day, if, if all prices come down, Energy costs will come down. Will come down, and that and, will also reduce inflation. You know, it's a, it's and a, that will have a knock-on effect. A knock yeah. effect. So at the end of the day, we should be aiming for all prices to go down, but it's not looking likely because this war, we don't know when it's going to end. Yeah, and um, on all indications that we have now are that 
uh, all those planning, all those participating, are saying it's going to be around for quite a bit. Quite a bit. So uh, it remains to be seen. Markets are highly, it's been a rough, you know, first quarter for markets. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it depends on your, you know, investing strategy. If you're a long-term investor, you can maybe handle some of this uh, volatility. But the winners for the first quarter, commodities, oil markets, those are the winners because of the disruptions we're seeing. Indeed. Yeah. Laddie, as always, it's good for you to unpack this. There'll be more, of course, from uh, Laddie and Ini John Mekwa uh, later on in our broadcast. Uh, Business Morning follows this program. And then, of course, Business Incorporated is there at 1.30. Before we leave, let's take a look, quick look at the sport. The Wimbledon Championship has reached a flashpoint with some of the top men's players reportedly urging the ATP to withdraw all our ranking points over its ban of Russian and Belarusian players. The All England Club adopted its strong stance in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February, saying it wanted to limit Russia's global influence through the strongest means possible. According to The Times, uh, Wimbledon's top brass are now locked in crisis talks with the ATP over the latest development, with an announcement expected sometime later this week. All four Grand Slam tournaments are worth 2,000 ranking points each to the winners, and the players believe it would be unfair to hand out those points if players like Daniel Medvedev, who is the reigning U.S. Open champion, is barred from competing. And fans from all over the world have said it is wonderful to attend the first Eurovision Song Contest semi-final in Turin, Italy. The contest has long tried to distance itself from politics, but the prominence of Ukraine this year and Russia's ban from entering has brought politics center stage. Musicians representing Ukraine were selected yesterday to advance to the finals of this year's Eurovision Song Contest. The European Broadcasting Union, which organizes the contest, had initially decided it will allow a performer to represent Russia, but change course less than 24 hours later following a public outcry. Ukraine and others had petitioned the European Broadcasting Union to bar Russia from participating. The grand finale will take place on Saturday following the second semi-final, which is said to happen on Thursday in Turin as well. And it's on that note that we end the program this morning. Thank you so much for being with us. My name is Ladi Akiri Duluali. There's an update at 5 o'clock. Do watch out for that. But do go out there and have yourselves a wonderful week.